And uh, with that, I would like to turn this over to Keith Ward. He is RIATA's Chief Development Officer, and he will be presenting the data in this WebEx tonight, as well as answering any questions on the back end. So with that, Keith. Great. Well, thanks, Lacey. And Lacey, can I just confirm that you can hear me OK and that you can uh, perhaps see slides advance? Yes, to both of those. I do hear you, and I can see your next slide. That's great. Well, I just would like to add my welcome to that of Lacey's. Um, good evening or good morning, depending on exactly where you are. Um, as Lacey said, I've got about maybe a 20-minute presentation. Um, of course, Lacey will interrupt me at any point if, uh, if you guys can't hear well enough. Um, the topics are here that we thought we'd cover tonight. Really, this is mostly an, an introduction to RIATA. We know that many of you in the community don't know us uh, at all, probably. If, uh, and we thought it would be good to introduce you a little bit to our company, our lead uh, investigational product, Bardoxalone Methyl, a little bit about how it works, what we've been doing, uh, why we're interested in Alport syndrome, uh, and kind of where we are in the process. Uh, and then again, as Lacey said, uh, we really hope you guys send questions uh, using that chat feature, and we can address uh, all of those uh, as we get towards the end. So uh, a little bit about Riata. Uh, so we are a clinical stage pharmaceutical company, and what that basically means is that we do not have any marketed product. Uh, we don't sell any products. Uh, we're mainly a clinical research stage company. We are based uh, in the U.S. in Irving, Texas, and Irving is in the middle of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, uh, so in the southern U.S. Uh, we've been around a little while. We were founded in 2002, uh, and we're fairly small, although growing. We currently have about 75 employees. Um, with a company that size, of course, we, we have to focus our efforts, and uh, we don't do a lot of our own internal research. Mainly, we collaborate with uh, leading universities, both in the U.S. and around the world, uh, to identify promising molecules, bring them in, and push them through product development, uh, mainly focused on uh, rare orphan diseases. Our lead compounds that I'll talk about, for example, were in license from some inventors at uh, Dartmouth University and uh, UT Southwestern. And uh, as I say, we, you know, we're a small company, uh, and so we like to focus where we think we can have the biggest impact uh, on disease and on patients, which is in rare disease. We currently are, are focused on pulmonary hypertension, as well as some rare neuropathies called Friedreich ataxia. Um, some muscle diseases called mitochondrial myopathies, and, and of course, soon to come, uh, Alport syndrome. I mentioned uh, earlier that you know we are small, and uh, part of the reason we like working in rare diseases is working with patient groups, and we do like to partner very closely with patient groups where possible uh, to get the voice of the patient and really help guide our clinical approach. The photograph that you see here is a photograph of our team taken, I guess, about 18 months ago, and it just happens to be a day when we were visited by representatives from the Free Direct Ataxia Research Alliance, uh, and a couple of the patient representatives came to visit with us. So we really like uh, getting the voice of the patient uh, and, and uh, do that however however we can. So just a little bit about our, our lead agent. You know, we're science nerds at Riata. We, we really focus on the science, and so I'll, uh, you know, try not to go too much into depth. I, I get kind of excited sometimes uh, when talking about this. Uh, there's a lot of information on our website listed there at riatapharma.com, and you guys can dig in. Uh, all you like. Um, but just a little bit about Bardoxalone methyl, which is our leading investigational agent uh, in clinical development. It's an, it's an oral drug, so it's a simple capsule, usually taken once a day. We've tested the product in over 2,000 people, both healthy volunteers and in patients with a, a variety of disease states, and some of those are, are listed here on this slide. A little bit about how the drug works. This, of course, is um, a cartoon of uh, just a cell in the body. And, you know, we're uh, sort of, our, our cells experience insult all the time and stress, whether that's cellular stress or chemical stress, inflammation or genetic damage. And the cell has very good mechanisms ordinarily for dealing with that stress. Uh, the cell produces inflammation, uh, and the cell then turns that inflammation off in a normal setting using a, a pathway called the NRF2 pathway. Um, and so there's this sort of yin and yang in a normal cell. Of course, in disease under conditions where the stress is continual uh, or there's chronic inflammation or in a genetic uh, a, a dysfunction where uh, there's a lifetime of a genetic disorder, this inflammatory process can get out of control and the body can't turn it off in a normal way. Our drugs act to mimic this process that the body naturally uses to resolve inflammation. And so we serve to turn up these processes and we attempt them to restore balance uh, to the cell. 
And so what we've seen in other clinical settings and in animal models, and I'll talk a little about uh, that in a bit, is both acute effects, so we can improve the function of some different organs in disease states, and uh, ultimately we hope chronic effects, uh, where over the long term we're able to chronically suppress uh, this, these long-term damaging effects. And so, uh, we, as I say, we've studied the drug in, in many different settings, but probably the setting we have the most experience with is in the kidney. Uh, and with renal effects. Um, and we have this very interesting finding that's, as far as I know, unprecedented really in clinical research that over and over again in a, a variety of different clinical settings, um, we see an increase in kidney function. Uh, and this is measured by uh, EGFR, which is the glomerular filtration rate, uh, which I think most of you probably know quite well, is a number that reflects how well your kidneys work. Um, and this number, of course, decreases with time in different diseases. It decreases in aging, it decreases in diabetic kidney disease, um, and of course in, in Alport syndrome, which we have not yet studied. Um, and you can see this, this little table just represents some of the clinical research that we've done. These are the numbers of patients that we studied in the N column. And consistently, whether that's patients with cancer or pulmonary hypertension or diabetic kidney disease, we see an improvement, an increase in, uh, that's significant in this GFR number. Um, and we know from animal models that this is accompanied by suppression of, of sort of bad stuff in the kidneys. This decreases in inflammation, decrease in injury and fibrosis. In the clinic, these effects are chronic, so they're seen over at least a year of dosing, which is about as far out as we've dosed with the product so far. Uh, when you take the drug away and look again in three or four weeks, uh, the effect at least partially is retained, so we, we think there's a long-term beneficial effect uh, on the kidney. Uh, so. Uh, why do we know all of this? Um, we did this very, we did a very large clinical program um, a few years ago, culminating in a study uh, called the Beacon study. We wanted to describe that to you guys real quickly. There's a whole bunch of words on this slide, and I'll try to just summarize it. Um, we know that if you go look up Riata or Bardoxalone, you'll, you'll probably find some information about the Beacon study, and we just wanted to share that with you uh, on, as an introductory uh, web app. So we were interested for quite some time in chronic kidney disease caused by diabetes. Um, we did a number of phase two studies. We were quite excited by the results. And so we moved into what would be a, a registrational phase three study, international study, over 2,000 patients. Um, and this was a study where uh, we studied very severely affected CKD patients with stage four kidney disease. Um, we had designed it based on earlier studies in less severely affected patients, but this was a study in which we wanted to evaluate outcomes um, in very serious patients. Um, we got the study fully enrolled, but then we had to stop the study early due to a safety signal that we didn't see in less sick patients. And specifically, um, we saw an increase in the number of patients who were being hospitalized for fluid overload. Um, and at the end of the day, it was about a 4% or so uh, greater number of those uh, with drug treated than with placebo. And so we had to stop the study, and of course this was you know, really very disappointing for the, the CKD community at the time, and for us as well. Um, and we did a, about a year's worth of analysis. And at the end, uh, we discovered that after we got all the data in and, and really worked it up, that this increased risk of fluid overload was really manifest in patients who came into the study in heart failure, and they were not appropriately diagnosed as having heart failure when they started. Um, this effect happened only very acutely in the first few weeks of starting the study drug, didn't happen more over time. We studied their heart function carefully, and we did not see any damage or adverse effects on the heart uh, or any increase in death. Uh, this was really just an effect uh, on fluid status. And so we, we took that learning, and we from now on, we, we very carefully exclude patients uh, who have those risk factors. Um, so we carefully monitor fluid status and the first few months of patients taking study drug. We weigh patients every day. We have not seen any signs of this fluid retention since then. Uh, we've shared this analysis with multiple divisions of FDA and with the Japanese health authorities. Uh, we've been allowed to proceed with clinical development. And so uh, obviously, of course, we were, we were disappointed about the outcome in diabetic CKD patients many of whom have these features. But it really encouraged us to keep looking at Bardoxol and methyl and uh, wherever we could, uh, advance it in development in populations that would be suitable. 
So that's just, again, a little about the Beacon study. We know you'll find some information out there if you go kind of search around about Bardock's run, some of it accurate, some of it less so. We wanted you to hear it directly from us. So all of that, uh, you know, unfortunate uh, negative outcome notwithstanding, we actually did see some very interesting positive effects from the Beacon study. Um, we saw favorable kidney effects, so a decrease in kidney serious adverse events in these patients, uh, decrease in end-stage renal disease, increase in GFR, uh, improved metabolic parameters as well, which is a feature of our drug. And so we, we've moved on with Bartoxalone into other disease populations. Um, so that includes pulmonary hypertension. And also we have a development partner in Japan who are studying this still in CKD. And again, we, we've not seen any of the fluid overload um, effects since we started applying the, the risk factors for that. So. All that's interesting, but probably not uh, as relevant to you guys as, as you'd like. You know, we, we see effects on uh, other disease states. Um, so we see improvements in six-minute walk distance and you know, muscle metabolism. In general, the drug is fairly well tolerated, besides, of course, the fluid overload events seen in that subpopulation. Um, we see mainly mild side effects. Uh, at higher doses, we can see an increase in mild transient nausea especially in patients with PAH. This has not been uh, debilitating. It's just been kind of a, an uneasy nausea uh, that happens and, of course, goes away when the drug uh, is, goes away or is taken down in dose. Um, we see some muscle cramps, uh, which mainly happens in diabetic patients, we think, as a function of their metabolic disease. And also in those patients, we observe weight loss in very obese patients. Um, we think, again, that's a metabolic feature of the drug. And we have not observed significant weight loss in patients who have a normal body mass index. Of course, we, we've only studied in 2,000 or so patients, so there could be other side effects. And as with any investigational agent, uh, any future trial participant should, of course, very closely discuss potential side effects and, uh, and risk benefit with, with their physician. So I think I've only got two or three more slides, and then we'll, we'll start taking some questions. Um, but those really focus on the why about Alport syndrome. Um, you know, we're fairly new to the Alport space, and so you guys know this a lot better than we do. Um, but as you know, uh, in Alport syndrome, there's a genetic mutation in the genes that encode type 4 collagen. And this is a structural protein that's very important in building the basement membrane uh, in the glomerulus of the kidney, which is the functional unit that filters the blood, uh, and of course also is uh, in the ear and the eye. And over time, worsening damage to this glomerular basement membrane is sort of shown here in this cartoon where you've got kind of a normal glomerular basement membrane in blue here, uh, and down in the picture below this sort of basket weave appearance uh, of the, the basement membrane in, a, in an Alport patient. And this results in protein spilling into the urine and then being reabsorbed. And as it turns out, protein is a very potent inflammatory signal. And so it uh, begins with an acute inflammatory process that sort of builds and cascades on itself over time so that there's more and more protein, more and more inflammation. The body tries to adjust to that. There's this chronic remodeling or fibrosis in the kidney, which, of course, in the long term results in a loss of kidney function. Um, and as, uh, as we all know, uh, that ultimately can result in end-stage renal disease and the need for a dialysis or, or kidney transplant. Um, so based on what I told you before about our molecule's ability to sort of stop inflammation, re 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 resolve inflammation in a, in a way the body naturally uses, and the improvement in kidney function we've seen in other CKD patients, we think, we hope, that Bardoxolone methyl may be able to do this in patients with Alport syndrome. Um, I've showed you, again, some of the features in diabetic CKD, which we hope will translate over. We don't know this yet, uh, and of course that's why we want to do a clinical study. That's what we're trying to do in our clinical research program. Um, and so that's, that's really where we're headed in, in alpha syndrome and why. So where are we today? Well, earlier this year, uh, this fall, we approached the FDA with a design for what we intended to be kind of our initial clinical study in patients with alpha syndrome. Um, we had really great engagement from the alpha patient community in the U.S. with the uh, alpha syndrome foundation. Um, we were uh, blessed to have Sharon Lagas from the foundation uh, help us with that meeting. Um, it was a big help, I think, both to us and to FDA to hear from the patient voice. And in that meeting, the FDA gave us some very interesting advice. They told us that a single trial uh, using an EGFR endpoint, uh, if we're able to study the long-term effect of the drug uh, and, the, and the effect of the drug after a few weeks of no, not 
affecting the drug. So in other words, uh, an apparent effect on the underlying disease could be registrational, could be the basis for approval. This was quite exciting for us, a little bit unexpected. You know, drug development is ordinarily quite a long process, and it starts with animal studies, and it goes into healthy volunteers, and small studies, and larger studies. Um, because we've been working with Bardoxel and Method for so long, the FDA has given us a bit of an opportunity, if things work well, to sort of jump to the front of the line. So if the study, which we plan to execute soon, goes well, uh, it could be the only study required before we're able to apply for marketing authorization. So that's quite exciting. We've been working very hard then to since design this single phase two, three study of Bardoxel and Methyl and Alport syndrome. Um, we're still finalizing details of the study design, and of course there, there are more details to come. But a little about our plan, uh, it's listed here. We intend to do first a, a fairly small phase two study. This will be an, a, a so-called open label study. That is, everyone who enters this part of the study will be on active drug. Uh, our intent here is to just very quickly assess whether or not Bardoxel and Methyl can improve EGFR in Alport patients as it does in diabetic patients. Uh, and if it does, are there any major differences? Does it affect younger people more than people who are a little older, uh, people who have more or less protein in their urine? Um, and basically let us tweak our design for what will then roll into the phase three or registration portion of the study, which is, again, that which could be uh, enabling of registration. This will be a placebo-controlled study, so it's a 50-50 chance that patients in this part of the study will either be on drug or a dummy pill. Um, that's really critical for FDA uh, and other health authorities to assess efficacy. Um, and it's designed, again, to support a potential approval. Both parts of the study will be based on um, EGFR, uh, so simple blood and urine measurements. We, we don't require a kidney biopsy as part of our study procedures. Um, and so that's, we hope, a study that's fairly straightforward for patients to participate in. We hope to include a, a broad range of patients in the study. We currently plan to include patients from the ages of 12 up to the age of 60. We know there may be some um, younger younger patients, particularly boys, who could participate and, and maybe their older family members as well. We hope to include a fairly broad range of kidney function to explore that. That was important to FDA, and we'd like to do that, uh, as well as patients with both um, high and low levels of protein in their urine. Um, it'll be an international study. And it's not listed here, but uh, I, we certainly intend to do the study in the U.S. at a variety of study centers, as well as outside the U.S. Um, we, we hope to include centers in Canada and Europe, as well as in Australia. And so we're hoping, planning, working hard, and expecting to be able to initiate the study in the first half of uh, next year. So I have uh, a few more uh, uh, thoughts on a, one last slide later about kind of next steps and where we're going. Um, but I think this may be a good time to transition to a little bit of Q&A uh, from the audience. So while Lacey's compiling some of those last questions, uh, we're just a couple of things that we were asked at the last WebEx that I thought I'd go ahead and address here. Um, someone asked about uh, criteria for participating in the study. Of course, we'll share full inclusion exclusion criteria, um, but I did want to let everyone know that uh, we, we will require the genetic test for Alport syndrome. We know that some patients, however, may not have that, and we, of course, pay for that uh, screening as, as in the course of the study. So we'll cover all that. We arrange for the screening. We've contracted with testing labs to take care of that. Um, also, uh, another question that we get sometimes is um, for people particularly who may not have participated in research, do you have to travel um, to participate in the study? And so, yes, uh, not all the way to Texas, however, <laughs> unless you happen to live here. Uh, so we tend to open a, a fairly large number of study centers in the U.S. as well as in other countries, and we're going to do our best to make study centers accessible to patients um, as quickly as we can. And, of course, we'll cover any, any travel costs. So Lacey, I know you've been compiling questions. You want to share a few of those with me and I'll see if I can answer them? Sure. I think I'm just starting to see a few roll in. The first question, Keith, is do antiemetics work with nausea? Um, yes, we, we've seen success with that. Um, and again, this is uh, the nausea that we've seen has been mild and transient. It kind of comes and goes. Um, our best solution for that, frankly, generally is to, is to dose titrate down and just go down one dose level. We're allowing for that in the study. And so if a patient just is kind of uncomfortable and feeling a little bit of nausea, we encourage the investigator to just go down one dose level. Um, hopefully that will allow the patient to retain any favorable effect, uh, but not be tickling that range of side effects for that individual patient. 
but yes, antiemetics um, have been used successfully as well, um, although dose de-escalation is the, the primary way we resolve that. All right, next question. Why do you think avoiding progression to end-stage renal failure was insignificant? Was it not studied mm -hmm. long enough, or does it not work in that way? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I'll just, if I can, flip, quickly flip back to that slide about Deacon. Um, and so I think the, the, what was referred to here is this uh, bullet, big bullet one, small bullet two, um, that we did see a decrease in end-stage renal disease events, as in, but it was not statistically significant. The Beacon study was powered to enroll 2,000 patients and then follow them until they had an event. And that event for these patients would have been generally transition to dialysis, um, that is, end-stage renal disease, uh, or unfortunately death, because many of these patients were, were quite ill. Because we had to stop the study early, we didn't have time to accrue enough overall events to be able to detect that signal. It was definitely moving in the right direction. Um, and so we believe strongly that had we been able to complete the study, we would have observed a significant difference in end-stage renal events. Uh, unfortunately, we just didn't get to complete the Beacon study and, and see that effect. Great. Next question. Have you considered studying this medication on the Alport mice? Why or why not? We have. Um, and so we've been in touch with... So there are no kind of commercial vendors that people don't sell the Alport mouse kind of commercially that are, that we could find. We've been in touch with a number of research investigators um, and you know, many of them have studied Alport mice in the past. Um, it seems like it may be faster <laughs> for us to, uh, to move directly into our initial clinical setting and do the mouse study kind of in parallel. It's something we're very interested in doing. Uh, we've spoken, for example, with Dr. Oliver Gross in Germany who, who runs the study in his lab as well as a couple of people in the U.S. We're definitely thinking about it uh, and hope that we can find a way to do that in 2017. Thanks. That's it um, for right now. Sharon, I don't know if you have any questions or anyone else has questions. I actually just saw another one pop up, but um, you guys feel free to keep sending these my way. This is the next question. My son's EGFR is now 22 related to Alport. Would he be able to be a candidate for the study? Um, Probably not uh, in this initial study. I think we, uh, right now, I think we're going to go down as low as 30 on EGFR. Um, it's something that we're still working out uh, with FDA, the final design feature. Uh, I encourage you to kind of stay tuned and watch this space. Uh, I'm unsure if 22 will be a number that we'll go down to in the study at the end of the day. Um, if not, uh, we certainly hope that we can offer a study uh, later for more advanced patients after our initial study. Uh, and so we'll we'll try to make that very clear when we roll out the inclusion exclusion criteria. I think another question uh, that was asked in the last WebEx, Lacey, while you gather a few more, some people uh, wanted to know, can I take this with my ACEs and ARBs? Um, is there any drug interaction to be concerned with? And the answer is yes. We, we would like patients to continue on whatever background medications they're already taking. We'd like uh, patients to be stable on an ACE or ARB. Um, before entering the study and then try to stay on that dose, but, but absolutely, and we, we don't see any drug drug interactions uh, to date with products on methyl of concern. Okay, Keith, another question about side effects. What other side effects besides nausea and heart failure exacerbation, exacerbation with, in those with it? So a re-review, maybe a recap again of the um, side effects? Absolutely. Um, so I listed a few here on, on the slide that I flipped back to. Um, we, as we, we talked about the, the nausea, we see muscle cramps, mostly in diabetic patients, uh, some in PAH patients. Um, these muscle cramps tend to be those that, they, that patients report them kind of feeling like after heavy exercise. Um, again, we think this may be related to the metabolic effects of the drug. We've seen some, some biochemistry changes, some lab value changes. Uh, magnesium in the serum has gone down, but it's not a loss of magnesium. We've measured this carefully in the urine. We think it's magnesium going into cells to make um, the energy in these processes that we know we turn up. But that's been reported as an adverse event. And then the weight loss uh, in obese patients is sometimes reported as a side effect. Um, other than that, really the, there, are, there are a few other small ones, um, but the imbalances are, are quite, uh, quite small and generally in favor of uh, baroxyl and placebo. No. Next question, is this supposed to take the place of a drug like Losartan, or is it in addition to this? 
Uh, we intend for bardoxolin to be used along with losartan and other drugs like it. Um, could it take the place someday of a drug like that? It's possible. The, we, we intend to just uh, essentially add it on to the existing therapy. We don't, we don't want to first do no harm. We want to okay. don't take any drugs away from patients if they may be doing good. Um, and then uh, hopefully add bardoxolone to existing therapy. Next question was about what if, what if a patient is also in Athena? Um, so from our perspective, uh, we've written our inclusion and exclusion criteria in the study to be quite broad. And in any uh, registrational, uh, sorry, yeah, registrational study or in any non-interventional study, a non-drug study, um, you could participate in our study. Uh, of course, we would encourage any Athena participants uh, to check with their investigator and make sure that the inclusion criteria there allow that. We understand that it would, um, but that's something that would be definitely worth checking uh, with the, the, the trial position for Athena about. Perfect. Next question. If the drug shows significant improvement in renal function, how long do you anticipate until it's on the market? Um, Good question. So if we're able to begin the study as we hope in uh, 2017 and do this initial phase two study, um, the one that will be open label to get an, an early idea, we're very hopeful that uh, by the end of the year we'd be prepared to move into that phase three study. Um, that phase three study will, will take a little while to enroll. Um, of course, the, the more help we can get from the community, the better, and we'll try our best to get it enrolled quickly. Uh, the FDA advised us that Data after a year of drug treatment uh, for that group of patients, uh, w they would be willing to review that and consider possible approval of the drug. Um, and so however long it takes us to enroll that phase three part of the study plus a year of data review and then get that in front of the FDA uh, for their review uh, would be the time frame. It takes a while. Drug development is a frustratingly long process. And so it, it's probably going to be early 2019. Um, before we're able to you know, think about that, maybe late 2019, depending on the speed of, of enrollment. Um, we're committed to do everything we can to move this quickly. Great. What screening will be done to determine if a patient is at risk of fluid retention? We have um, developed, based on our pretty large Beacon data set, uh, what we think is a very good algorithm. Again, FDA has reviewed this, PMD has reviewed this, it's been affected in other trials. We essentially make sure, number one, that a patient uh, has not had a history of heart failure. Um, and we just gather that through medical history. Um, second, there's a circulating enzyme. It's called, the, the biochemical name is BNP. Um, it's a kind of a standard lab panel. And that's an uh, indicator of whether a patient has heart failure. So we measure that. It's a simple blood draw. Uh, we pay for that and measure that. And those two things together, are very predictive of whether a patient might be susceptible for fluid overload. So we screen out patients using those criteria. And then, once we enroll patients in the study, we're very careful for the first few weeks of treatment. And we ask patients to weigh themselves daily. We provide a nice scale, uh, ask people to write that down. If they see a sudden weight gain, just to call the treating physician uh, who can get them seen quickly and in case their fluid might need to be managed or a diuretics change so they can take care of that uh, in a way that we didn't appreciate in Beacon. Uh, that's been successful in our other studies so far. We've not seen any fluid overload events, and uh, we hope that trend continues in future studies, including our outdoor study. Right, next question. Can you provide any more information on when recruitment might start? Um, so we're very hopeful that uh, very early next year, as in January, that some of our initial sites can begin screening patients. These will probably be some of our U.S. sites that begin first uh, and then internationally a little bit later um, in the first half of the year. Um, as we go on, and we'll talk about this kind of on the last slide, uh, we'll be very sure to keep the community updated um, as we take each step in the process so that uh, any patient who'd like to participate will get information about that. Great. And I think this goes back to some of the side effects discussed a few moments ago. A question came in about whether magnesium supplements help. To do. Um, so we, uh, we encourage people to take magnesium supplements if their magnesium gets low. Uh, again, this is a side effect that we have not seen so much in our PAH patients. We saw it more with diabetic patients. We're unsure what we see with Alport, so we'll watch that closely. But 
yes, supplement with magnesium, uh, supplements bring that, back, bring that back up again. Great, next question. What is the half-life of Bardoxamon? Uh, humans, the half-life is uh, between 18 and 24 hours, so it's a once-a-day product. Okay, the next question is, how will we be notified of the next step in this program? Are you going to keep our registration info from this meeting? And I can actually answer that question, that this is the first um, in what we hope will be a series of WebEx meetings with the community. And as soon as we have um, the appropriate regulatory approvals to share much more information about the actual clinical trial and the design and where all of our investigative centers will be, we, we will reach out to you with another WebEx similar to this one um, to talk in great detail about the actual design of the study and how to, how to get in contact with one of the research centers. We, have, we will have a study website which also explains information about the trial and as soon as we can message those out to the community through the ASF or other mechanisms, we certainly will do that. The next question, what is the lowest GFR you've seen and what type of positive response in those patients? Hmm. Um. That's a really good question. I don't know the lowest individual GFR that we tested in our Deacon study, um, but you can see if I flip back to this table um, on the top row, um, the Deacon study included stage four CKD patients, um, so patients all the way down to the, the cusp of dialysis down into the low 20s. Um, we enrolled, as we said, about 2,000 of those, and the average increase, this is average increase in GFR, was about six points, uh, again, from a base of around 20, 21, I think was around the average. Um, so we see, uh, obviously, you know, meaningful uh, improvements in GFR in those patients. Of course, the, the lower, the, the more severely affected, the lower the baseline eGFR, um, the lower our magnitude of change, which is why we'd like to intervene in disease as, as early as we can. Um, and you can see that in some of our other uh, CKD experience shown here, patients had somewhat higher eGFRs and, and somewhat higher responses um, as well. So I think generally we see uh, you know, a, a six to eight point improvement in EGFR with the drug. Great. I'm going to blend these next two questions together. The first, Keith, is how many people will be in the phase two open label study? And second, if you participate in the phase two study, can you participate in the phase three study afterwards? Ah, um, so I simplified things probably a little too much when I described it as a sort of a sequential first to phase two, then a phase three. Um, the fact is that both of the phase two and phase three designs are, are identical. Really the only difference between those is that in the first one it's just a small number of patients, no placebo, uh, and then we'll, we'll roll in and add patients and, and add placebo. So phase two patients will actually continue to take the drug for the full amount of time that they would if they were in the phase three study. And so because of that, and because those then will be going on at the same time, if you're in sort of the, the phase two portion of the study, you'll always be in that part. If you're in the phase three, you'll always be in that part. The only difference is there's a 100% chance that you'll be on active drugs if you're in the phase two part, so one of those first few patients, um, and there's a 50-50 shot if you're in the phase three part. In terms of the numbers, uh, again, we're, we're still working on this with, with FDA, but the number is likely to be around 30 patients in the phase two part of the study. Great, next question. My grandson will be 12 in August. Will you be enrolling in the study still at that time? I absolutely believe we'll still be enrolling in August. I think we'll have rolled into the phase three study by that point. Um, I really hope we get the phase two study enrolled quite quickly, um, but at that point by August, I, I think there will still almost certainly be open study slots available. My doctor was a participant in your 2012 study. Can I assume it likely that he will be able to participate in the Cardinal study? Um, it's a good question. So we uh, are selecting sites for the Cardinal study all around the U.S. Of course, we know that the Alport Foundation um, has the, the Medical Advisory Committee, so these experts in, in Alport um, syndrome treatment. We're including as many of those in the U.S. that we can. And then we actually did go back to our, our list of that. That was the Beacon study that I talked about. We went back to our Beacon investigators and started calling those in major population centers around the country. Um, I think everyone we called was really excited to participate. Um, that was a huge study, and we won't be able to put all of those investigators back in, but we're putting as many back in as we can, so there's a good chance, uh, depending on where you live, that your investigator uh, could be a participant. 
Um, if not, uh, we, we hope that there's uh, certainly a study center close enough to you to make it convenient to, to participate. And this is the last question I see for now. So I would say last call if anyone has anything additional. Um, feel free to send those over. Um, Keith, this question is, do you think you'd see more improvements in GFR over time? Is it better to start with higher GFR with hopes of maintaining? Mm. Um, it's a big question. It's one that we don't really know the answer to completely because, of course, we've only studied patients for over about a year um, and because we had to terminate our other study before we really were able to see the full effects in end-stage renal disease. My personal belief and scientific belief is that the earlier we can intervene in disease and stabilize that decline, the better off we're likely to be. Um, I don't have a lot of data to support that. That's just my, my professional, personal belief. Um, and I, I do think that it would be better to intervene in the earlier stage of disease when EGFR is higher um, and we can boost that number as high as we can go and change that trajectory in a positive way. You know, I think outward patients, on, on average, everyone's different, but on average lose about four GFR points a year. So it would be amazing for us if we were able to increase EGFR in an outward patient by four points and then preserve that. That's the equivalent of two years off dialysis. If we could take it at eight points um, and keep that, um, that's at least three years difference in dialysis and maybe longer over the long term. That's our aspiration, and we really hope it works out, but uh, we'll have to kind of get the study going and see what happens. Good. I have two more questions. The first one, was there histopathological reduction of inflammation at the cellular level in kidney tissue in the Beacon study? We did not take kidney biopsies in Beacon. Um, in fact, we, we have not taken kidney biopsies in any of our kidney studies before. We, that's just not something that we've done. We have a ton of preclinical evidence in animals that shows suppression of all sorts of inflammation markers, cytokines, biomarkers, decrease in tissue fibrosis. We have a lot of published literature about that. Much of it's on our website, uh, for if you care to look at it later. We don't have any in humans, um, but we do have animal uh, data that supports that, that that may well go on. Great, and this looks like our last question for now, unless someone sneaks one in at the end. If someone participates in the HERA study, and you are still recruiting for Cardinal after they finish, will they be able to participate in Cardinal? Um, the short answer is probably. Of course, you know, we'll have to make sure that everyone meets all the eligibility criteria, but uh, after a, a relevant washout period, uh, and I forget the exact duration, it, it's not something very long, uh, after having used other investigational agents, then, then we would welcome those participants to come in uh, to the Cardinal study. So yeah, I think, I think the answer is likely yes. Uh, although there'll be kind of a bit of a small waiting period between the two studies. Lacey, any other questions for now? I don't. It, it has um, quieted down on the chat side. Okay. Right. I don't well, see any additional I'll questions. Up, I'll finish up the last few thoughts, and you guys feel free to keep the questions coming while I do. Uh, someone asked this already, so I appreciate kind of the preview. Um, we definitely are committed uh, to keeping the community updated. Uh, you guys will be the key to our success in being able to randomize patients into the study uh, and be able to test this hypothesis. Our plan is to hold another one of these uh, with a little more detail. It's actually it's quite frustrating for us not to be able to share all of our study design and plans, but we're still kind of in the regulatory process. Um, so in early 17, we hope to have another one of these where we can share more specific details with you about our study. Um, if we're able to start uh, on the timeline that we expect, We'll provide a, a detailed study website. There'll be a study map where you can click on there to find the physician near you that's participating in the trial. Um, and we'll do that both for the U.S. as well as outside the U.S. Uh, until then, of course, you know we, we encourage you to visit our website at riatapharma.com. There's a bunch of information on there. Um, the patient groups have been just fantastic for us, very welcoming. They've been a great help to us. I think that you know they're a great help to you, and they have a lot of great resources on their website. And they're shown here. Um, you can watch for updates uh, uh, for all clinical studies at uh, clinicaltrials.gov. We don't have ours posted yet. We'll post it as soon as uh, we get regulatory clearance to do so. So you can watch that space. Uh, Han Nguyen, uh, who's on this WebEx tonight, whose email is listed here, is also always happy uh, to take questions. You can also reach Lacey at, at lacey.powers at riatapharma.com. Um, so any of us are, are always happy to, to take your questions. Um, so, Lacey, did you have any other questions that have come in uh, while I gave those last comments? 
Nope, it looks like that's it, Keith. Well, I'll, um, I'll begin to close at least by saying thank you again. Uh, we we really enjoy getting to know so far uh, some of the patients in the Alport community and the Alport Foundation. We hope to partner closely with you in the years to come. Please watch this space. Hope you found this a little bit useful as a kickstart uh, into Riata and Bardoxalone. Um, and we'll do everything that we can to keep you updated along the way. Lacey, any other closing comments? One last question from someone who I think joined a bit late, which was just what is the GFR criteria to participate? We haven't published the specific criteria just yet, uh, and because we're still uh, just waiting on FDA clearance uh, of our final numbers, and uh, we'll post that as soon as we can. Um, it, again, it probably won't go down to stage four CKD, so in, into the 20s, uh, probably not, um, but we'll, we'll post those specific numbers as, as soon as we can. And I do one see more another question. question about whether there's, yeah, whether there's GFR decline that's necessary. No. Uh, we, we don't require uh, that a patient have any particular GFR trajectory or decline uh, in order to participate in the study. I think that's it. I'm not seeing anything else except a few thank you messages coming across, so we appreciate those. Okay, Lacey, you want to close this out? And, and yes, normal GFR is, is okay. I think uh, we'll have an upper limit. Um, but it, it's a fairly high upper limit in the study. Yeah, so just um, just want to again say thank you guys. Um, we have really engaged last Thursday and uh, enjoyed rather engaging with the patient community and hearing from you guys. I think um, we just couldn't be more sort of excited with the, the patient partnership and, and access to the community that we've received from the ASF. And we, as Keith said, we look forward with great anticipation to having the regulatory approval to be able to share much greater detail about the actual study design and the centers that will be participating. So just to echo what Keith said, if you have any questions, please feel free to send us an email. We'd, we'd love to engage with you and answer anything that pops up um, later tonight or tomorrow. If you think of additional questions, uh, don't feel like this is your last chance to ask them over this WebEx, but we welcome um, further engagement with everyone. So we do appreciate your time tonight and uh, look forward to providing more information in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you.